How's everybody tonight? You should be in some of the houses I've been. It kind of looks like that. Um, next week will be Purim, so we'll be doing something on the Book of Esther. So looking forward to that. And uh, my favorite dessert will be Haman's ears. So make sure you uh, make sure you get here. Um, if you don't come next Wednesday, no, not yet. If you don't come next Wednesday, you get no Haman's ears. Because if there's any left over, I'll take them home. If you don't know what that is, come next week. Yeah, great dessert, just a little jelly thing. So anyway, uh, pour them next week's time. When does time change? I think it's coming up. Is it next week? It's, um, I think it's, uh, what day was it? The 12th. Okay, so that's coming up. So make sure you set your clocks, especially for Sundays, and especially since we're springing forward. So make sure, well, we shouldn't tell them. They'll just get, they'll actually be here on time. So that'll work. So that's it. And uh, we'll continue on next week with the tale of two cities, the tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. That's next week. Tonight, we'll start a little something that um, we haven't done in a while, and that's studying, not the Bible, but studying how to read the Bible. So help me read the Bible is what I'm calling it. It's just a quick devotional before we get into our updates. Not so much devotional, but it's a very quick thing. It's my favorite subject of all times is to talk about the Bible. And um, I think we are familiar with the Bible in our nation, but um, many people don't read it. Kind of looks like that. You ever seen something like that? Hopefully not in your house. Um, but, you know, I've taught different Bible classes, New Testament, Old Testament, different theology classes. And it's fun, and it's really fun to dig into. Uh, but I realized that a lot of people found those classes very complicated, um, mainly because they were new believers. Maybe they never taught or never were challenged to do that. So I challenged myself to do something that I want to teach something about the Bible that makes it so simple. Anybody can understand it and anybody can read it and anybody can uh, take on the call to uh, read the Bible, because I think it's the most important book to read. In fact, it's the most important book to read ever, but especially now. And so we want to keep the message intact, meaning we don't want to dilute it so much, but make it simple. So, so much of our society knows about the Bible because they've gone to church, or they know somebody that's gone to church, or maybe as a kid they, they actually went to church, but they never read it. They never studied it. They never really, for the purpose of understanding the Scriptures, they never did. They just simply knew it as a book that is in your home, maybe look like that. And, um, but if we're not indifferent about the Bible, that means if we're, we're still somewhat positive about maybe reading it, this may help you out, right? So without being indifferent, we can explore things about the Bible. So one of the things we know about the Bible is it's, it, it, and the way I like to express it is to listen to it in stereos because there are two sections in the Bible, and we know that, Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, otherwise known as the Tanakh, and the New Testament Scriptures, which is the New Testament revelation of Christ. And one of the important things to know about this is to listen to it in stereo. And, and the reason why I put it that way is because we kind of understand in our vernacular what that is, to put headphones on. Uh, I think I see every kid. Uh, now they don't have wires, so they have wireless. Uh, but to understand it in a sense of you, you hear one and you hear the other at the same time trying to make sense of the sound that's coming through your ear. So make, make sense of the sound that's coming from the Old Testament by understanding the New Testament. And it's, it's very similar to this. It's sort of like a highway that you head out to and search for the Lord and search for the understanding of the Lord. And you end up going through the Hebrew Scriptures into the New Testament. But there's more, isn't there? There's more up ahead. And this is where we're uh, just this section tonight because we're going to build on it over the next few weeks. Um, obviously, we'll be talking about Babylon and two cities. So every other week, we'll be talking about the Bible. And hopefully, it helps new believers. And hopefully, it helps people that are indifferent about the Bible, meaning that there may be believers that know the Bible. Maybe they understand the Bible, but it just has lost its, its zeal, has lost its, its grip on us. And so uh, one thing for sure that we know about the Bible, and this is the the interesting part is when we, we have our Bibles, it says holy, right? The, the first part, it says holy. And 
it is a holy Bible because it is about a holy God, right? It's a holy God. And so we need to examine the Bible in a way that it's not intimidating. When you read the Bible, it shouldn't be intimidating, meaning that some people um, believe, this is, this is a big part in our society, that you need someone that has special training and access to the Bible in order for you to make sense of it. Now, I do understand that we need teachers, and I do understand we need uh, some expert in some maybe field of writing or, or some field of language to make sense of some of the original language. But in terms of understanding, in terms of getting the big picture, every believer can get it. Every Christian can understand the Bible. This was the big thing during the Middle Ages, by the way, during the, the reign of the Catholic Church, is that they made it impossible for anybody to read it. Not only was the language different, but the theology was very different, but nobody understood it. Nobody understood what anybody could uh, said about the Bible, let alone the priest. Many priests didn't even know Latin. So many of them just kind of repeated the prayers or repeated the, the mantra, but they never really understood what the Bible said. And there was a man named William Tyndale who decided that by translating the Bible into English, and we owe a lot to Tyndale, and that's why we have it in English, is that he would make the young boy plowing on the field much more knowledgeable of the Bible than the priests that were in the monastery and in the churches at that time. And that's what his goal was set out to do. My goal is not set out to do it that way, but I understand his heart. And in the spirit of William Tyndale to understand that Anybody could read it, and anybody needs to approach God in a holy way. It's not complicated. Many Christians see the Bible like this. They can't make, and they, these are Christians. They, 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 they've been in the churches for a long time. They, they can't make heads or tails. You know, where is this book at? Is this New Testament or is it an Old Testament? And so without making it complicated, um, we have to make it accessible for people to read it. We have to make it accessible for people to read it. And every single person can understand the Bible. Uh, I would say that a lot of unbelievers would say that, yeah, you can never understand the Bible because it's, it's such a complicated book. And I think a lot of the reasons is people in churches have made it complicated because we, we argue about doctrine and argue about different things that at the end of the day may or may not be that important. But if the message, the central message is important, I think that's the critical part for every believer and every non-believer to start with, especially new believers to start with. What is the message of the Bible? What is the central message of the Bible? So we're just going to give uh, one aspect of the central message. There's different aspects of it, but uh, let's start at the beginning. Genesis 1.1. Let's go there very quickly. And if somebody can read um, Genesis 1.1, that would be great. <clears throat> if nobody wants to read, because it's a cold night, I understand that too. But um, it helps out. Revelation, I mean, uh, uh, Genesis 1 1. We'll go to Revelation in a moment. Genesis 1 1. And just think, just think about what the Bible says about the creation and the creator. Go ahead. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, everybody knows that verse, I would imagine. People have heard it. Uh, even unbelievers know about it. They might not believe it. They might deny it. But it is the reality of what the Bible says, that there is a creator God who began his work of creation on that particular day, the first day of creation. He created the heavens and the earth. Now, I do want to compare it to the last book of the Bible. So let's go to the last book of the Bible, and that's Revelation 21. And Revelation 21. So we go from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end of the Bible. During the 1900s, they said the Bible's like a loaf of bread. And people wonder, well, what is that? How, does that? how does that work? Well, if you cut a loaf of bread at the beginning and you cut a loaf of bread at the end, they looked exactly the same. Meaning that the Bible is like the beginning, it's like the end. Revelation 21 it's not the last chapter, but it's almost the last chapter. Uh, 21 verse 1. Let's read that one. 21 verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. There's quite a bit to unpack there. And before we get into some theological um, circles around what exactly does that mean, let's just take it for what it's worth. There's a creator God who began creation in Genesis 1-1 with the heavens and the new earth. 
And it ends, the Bible ends, with the same God, the same creator God, who is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And therefore, heaven itself, think about this, the heavens itself was made by God. God created the heavens and the earth. God created anything that is visible, things that are invisible. God created it all, and there's a new creation that's coming. This is quoted again from the Old Testament, a new heavens and a new earth. Drop down a little bit, your eyes a little bit down to verse 5, if somebody can read verse 5. And this is from the throne of God. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. So the same God from his throne repeats himself again, saying that he is going to make not just the heavens and the earth, all things new, all things new. And not to be so simplistic about it, but it, the Bible is really about the activity of God, meaning that from the beginning to the very end, God is at work. God is at work within humanity, in humanity, within history. And it ends as far as we could see in the Bible, before we get into eternity, into the eternal state, it is God who's working all things for one specific purpose, is that he is going to make a new creation. All the promises of God from Genesis 1 all the way up to this point are going to culminate in this promise that he's going to make all things new all things new. And therefore, we can see that the Bible is a very clear book about God's activity in, hu- in the hu- human history, in world history, in, in, in the history of heaven, and to bring about a true work, and that is a new heavens and a new earth. Now, the question would be, why do we need a new heaven and a new earth? Well, that's going to come along as we get through the, through the book because of sin. And what happened in Genesis is, of course, all of creation, including humanity, rebelled against God and turned away against God. So God has been in the, in seeking out humanity to make them a new creation. And ultimately, even the heavens and even the earth will become new. And uh, it's about a holy God. And that's why, you know, we talked about the Holy Bible. Well, the Holy Bible is the Holy Word of God because God is a holy God. Just like the, the book of Isaiah tells us, when Isaiah saw heaven, meaning he saw the throne of God, there were angels flying and saying, holy, holy, holy. So when reading the Bible, the first thing we have to think about this, this is not about humans, not just about humans, although we like to make the Bible human-centric. Uh, I'll give you one example. Did you know that most, most people that read the Bible, they, they don't remember too much about Genesis 1 and 2, sort of a forgotten chapter. Most people jump right to Genesis 3 or toward the end of Genesis 2. Why? Because that's when God made humanity. So people began to kind of understand Genesis from that perspective. And we forget that there's a whole six days or five days of creation that doesn't mention any man doesn't mention any humanity. It simply says he made man and woman and then goes back to God creating the world again and explaining it even further. So the Bible is not human centric. It is God centric. And it's a very important thing to remember. It's really a book about a God who says of himself that he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Of course, this is talking about Christ Jesus. And we'll talk more about Christ as we get into more of the Bible. He is the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the alpha and the omega and is exactly what that means. It means he he is in the past. He is in the present. He is in the future. He knows the end from the beginning. There's nothing that he's missing in terms of world history, in terms of where we're going. He's already been there in the future. He is with us now in the present. And he's also in the past as well. And it's that's for, hard for us to understand. It's, um, it's because we're not like God. God is able to be omnipresent in terms of history, in terms of history, in terms of where he's at and where he's been and where he will be. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God who was, who is, and who is to come. 
This is all related to God. Now, we're not getting into any theological discussions in terms of doctrines and things like that. We simply are speaking about what the Bible is about. I am the first and I am the last, says the Lord. Besides me, there is no other God. So in a very simple way, in a very straightforward way, the Bible is about the activity of God. And not just in human history, but in, in, in the world history. Before we were created, God was already at work. God was already at work. So when we read the Bible, it's, it's kind of like this. It's like a door that's being opened, meaning it's describing creation. We read it in Genesis. It begins to open up. But it goes all the way through into something that we can't hardly understand, which is the new creation that is coming. How does the new heaven going to look like? How does the new earth is going to look like? We don't know. But we can see something that he has already done new is that he began the work within humans by saving them. Because of sin, God decided that he would save humanity and he will bring humanity to a new creation. So these truths are just as amazing as the Bible. This is all in the Bible. We're not talking about any other book but the Bible. And it's a new creation. He makes all things new. He makes humanity new. He makes people like you and me new, right? And so when you look at the Bible, it could be challenging, challenging to a lot of people, challenging to kids, challenging to new believers, challenging to old believers, because they see it and they go, man, I never even read some of these books, you know, like Habakkuk and Zephaniah and some of these books that we don't even know where they are in the Old Testament. Uh, it's a challenge because the, the, the Bible almost looks like a, a reference book, like it's intimidating, you know, like some, some Bibles have like, you know, like it's, it's divided in half and it's got words on this side of the page and on this side of the page. It looks like a dictionary. And you know how much people love to read dictionaries. And it's got this stigma that, it's like a reference manual, like, like you know, you guys love, love to read manuals, you know. People think of the Bible like that, but it's much more than that, isn't it? Because how do we read it, and how do we really understand it? And hopefully this one does. Turn to Revelation 11. Turn to Revelation 11. This, this is highlights, and I like to spend time in Genesis. I like to spend time in Revelation just for you to see the loaf of bread, that it's the same. It begins with God creating an, uh, heavens and the earth. It ends with God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And in the process, God establishes his kingdom. Now look at it, chapter 11 and look at verse 15. And this is a, a, great, a great chapter. We studied it at, at length when we did Revelation 11 at Anthony's house. But it's a great chapter. It's a great verse for us to remember what ultimately is going to be about at the end, in eternity. Go ahead, Anthony. Who has it? Anthony, yeah. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. And he will reign forever and ever. The ultimate goal or the ultimate end of God is to rule, is to reign over his creation. Now, we have this word, telos. Now, you probably heard me say it, and I haven't said it in a while, that our theology, if you want to put it in those terms, is teleological. Um, I'm trying to be simple, right? So why would I bring this up? Because it, it helps explain something that maybe a lot of Christians miss. The word telos doesn't mean an end, although it's translated the end. Like Christ is the end of the law, that uh, verse says in Corinthians, and most people say, well, Jesus came to just end the law. But the word end doesn't mean end like, you know, it's final or stopping. The word end simply means the intent or the goal or the goal. Now, my son plays soccer, so he understands this one a little bit more. What's the goal? What's the intended purpose of God? What's the objective? What is God wanting to do? What is he aiming at? That's what the word telos means. What's the aim of his creation? We would say, what's the destination that the Bible wants to take us to? What is the ultimate meaning? From the end, from the beginning, from beginning to end. God has known the past. He's known the present. He's known the future. And with a very much assurance... He has said that that which he begun, he will complete it. That which he begun, the good work that he has begun, he will complete it. And he will complete it in creation. He will complete it by bringing a new creation. He'll complete it in humanity. 
by bringing us into a new creation. And these are amazing, enormous things, isn't it? Because one day, looking for that day, um, he will complete that good work, meaning that we're heading towards something. And this is what Christians need to be reminded every day. The purpose of existence and being a Christian is sometimes it could be quite doldrum, meaning the same thing happens over and over again. You get up in the morning, you do this, you do that. Yeah. But you're forgetting that God is at work completing something in humanity, yes, but bigger than that, right? He's completing something that he himself has said, I will make new heavens and a new earth. And all the problems of the world, all the problems of the world um, that seem unsurmountable will be, one day, will be overcome by God himself. Will be uh, any hurdle that you have, anything that seems to be impossible, that's the wonderful thing about the Lord is that he has decided that in, within himself, he's made a promise to bring a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, a new creation that he's going to make. So even though the past has been, you know, you said difficult, the now may be difficult, but the future is absolutely glorious because he has a telos in mind. He has a aim, a goal intended, and he will fulfill that which is started, and nobody is going to stop him. This is the great thing about the Bible, is that no matter what humans try to do, God will fulfill that which he begun, and he's told us about it. So it's, it's not like you can't know, like, well, what is a mystery? Yes, there's certain things that we will know until the end, but that which he has revealed, you can know. You can know where, if you... Uh, believe in the God of the Bible and in his son, Jesus Christ, you can know where you will go. You know where you're going. You're going toward a new Jerusalem. And there's so much more, is it? Because as much as they're in the Old Testament, there's so much, we say, in the New Testament, because of Christ, there's so much more. And so much more that we need to know. So in very simple terms, cutting through the mace, and cutting through maybe some of the obscurity that we have about the Bible, maybe some difficulties and maybe, maybe some PTSD from other places, other churches, or other things that you've learned and you're trying to unlearn it. At the very heart of the Bible is this, God's direction for our lives. And sometimes we think of direction in our lives. What am I going to do tomorrow? Who am I going to marry? What am I going to be doing? What is my work? And, and, and we get so caught up in those details. But in reality, God has already a purpose in mind. And the process is just what we're going through. That purpose is to bring us into the new Jerusalem, to bring us into something greater that we can ever even imagine in this life. From beginning to end, from the end to the beginning, where we're going, God has so much more for us. And in eternity, it's only the beginning. Think about that for, for, for Christians, for believers. Eternity is only the beginning. This is, you know, not to get too theological, but uh, for the unbeliever, it ends. It ends. It's, it's a loss. It's a, it's, a, it's a net loss, the Bible says. For the believer, it is only the beginning. It is a gain. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To go to be with the Lord is so much more gain. So... And understanding the Bible, we need to listen to it and accept the words that are um, told to us by God. And because it's a living God, it's, 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 a, it's a holy God, it's a holy Bible, it's a living word. And that's the beginning of our understanding, is to listen to it and understand it uh, for what it says. And there's one thing we have to do, and that is be fully engaged in it. That's the part that I think a lot of people become discouraged by it because it's so hard to understand, isn't it? Because it's so much confusion, we get discouraged and we're not engaged in it because we think it's, well, it's like a dictionary. It's a reference book. I'll, I'll go to it when I need it. Don't you, don't you need a reference book whenever you, you know, oh, I'll get to it when I need it. But the Bible is not a reference book. The Bible is the very heart and direction of God. And that is ultimately to get believers into the new Jerusalem. But it requires for us to be fully engaged in it. That means a maximum engagement, meaning we ought not to be, I got to go back, I should have put it at the end. This. 
right? If it starts looking like that, we're not being fully engaged. Does that kind of make the point, right? If we start to look like that, you know, uh, even if it's in your phone, right, um, we need to be fully engaged. We're not understanding what God is. We're not really understanding his goal and his purpose for us. And so let's listen to the Bible in stereo. Don't be afraid of the Old Testament. It's, a, it's the same God who wrote the New Testament. Um, maybe some history, maybe some things that we need to develop and maybe get it under our belt. And sometimes, you know, teachers are good for that. You know, helps you understand how it goes together. But any, any Christian can understand it. Any believer can understand it. And hopefully it goes at the heart of the matter for uh, the message of salvation is to come to know this God through his son, Jesus Christ. So that's the first part that we're going to talk about the Bible. We'll build on it because next time we'll talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about a man whom God chose in which he revealed himself in the Old Testament to be a blessing to all the nations. And we are partakers of that great blessing. Everybody know who that is? Abraham, Father Abraham, who is well known in the Old Testament and he should be well known in the New Testament because he is the father of all who believes. All right. We'll end with that. All right, so as an update, let's go through a few things. don't have a lot today because I want to focus on a few things, and I think it's important. Most people, most people would say, especially in America, live with the, the understanding. This is kind of an interesting thing. It's changed somewhat. Most Americans don't trust any news anymore. That is, that is the, the new, it's quite different, isn't it? If you grew up, 70s and 80s and 90s, you sort of there was somewhat of a respectable media, even though people denied it all the time and kind of it was it was a bit um, untrustworthy. But everybody loved Walter Cron- Cronkite, so everybody kind of trusted, right? Everybody trusted him, and he's the most trusted man on television and the news. And and but news have changed rapidly, and of course, it's become very different with the internet. It's quite different now. That means you can get a lot of resources, a lot of news without having even television. I mean, who would have thought about that? Trying to explain that to my grandparents that you can, who grew up in, with television as, a, you know, black and white and getting into the color things, right? Um, that you could actually get news without television? Well, it is not today. It is like that today. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but this is an interesting thing. The U.S. is finally admitting I can't talk too much about it because the tech overlords will get really upset. Uh, I'll talk about it on Catching Up on Friday on our our, our weekly Catching Up with Jacob show. Um, But guess what the U.S. is admitting? All that stuff that happened in 2020 to 2022 with the origin of the virus, they're admitting it, even if the FBI admitted that it came from a lab, a lab in China. And they're actually admitting it. And the FBI, this is, of course, uh, uh, one of the FBI directors, um, Christopher Wray, he declared yesterday, would have been yesterday, that the FBI stands by that assessment, that it was made despite all the craziness that happened. And even, you know, we even got strikes on this channel because of that, that because we said, yeah, it came from, it came from China. Um, now people are saying, yeah, it's true. It did. It happened. And uh, the origin is most likely, potentially, they say. So uh, we'll talk about that more on Friday. But I don't think we're going to get an apology for all the things we said, for all the things that we stood, for all the things that we, uh, we said, this is not, it's, it's not real. It's not what, it cl- what, is, what you're claiming to be. And, of course, uh, people made a lot of money. And, of course, people made a lot of money during the process because of the medicine that they develop. But all this is coming to pass that, hmm, it's not what it was in, uh, what everybody said it was, not what the news said. People were getting banned left and right. So I'll leave it there because otherwise it becomes really kind of a a losing battle. But it is interesting that now everybody, I would say not everybody, but a lot of people are aware that everything that happened from 2020 to 2022 was a big nonsense and um, so what was it for? Big theater? No, it did set up a lot of things, by the way. It did change the way the church is. It did change the way people think. It did change the way 
we spend our money. It did change the way technology is going. And one thing it changed rather rapidly is the way the, the world and nations treat each other. Now, Jesus spoke about nations and kingdoms. He spoke about nations will be at war with each other. Nations will be against each other, and kingdom will be against other kingdoms. Something that Jesus said would happen. Now, of course, the skeptical mind will always say, but there's always been wars, right? I always hear that. Almost like a back of my mind, PTSD, right? There's always been wars. Why? Because every time we say something, there's always a smart person in the in the audience that would say, well, what's the big deal? There's, why do you talk about this stuff? There's always been wars. Yes, there's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. But what Jesus was trying to say, if you put it all in context, is that there'll be a time where there's never been quite like this. It'll be a time where all nations will be at odds with each other. And all nations will come against one particular nation. That would be Israel. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the world superpowers, this particular time, so it's been one year since Russia invaded Ukraine. It's been one year, February 24th. The world superpowers have been betting on this event. And what I mean by betting is that they put their cards on the table now. Cards are on the table, and guess what it came up? It came up that they're in favor of a major war, meaning that most super, all superpowers and most nations are involved in some capacity or another with this war, Russia and Ukraine. And every one of them, every one of them has come up with this idea that we need to destroy Russia. We need to destroy Russia, and we need to support Ukraine at all costs. No matter what, how corrupt they are, we need to provide, because this is a war for all the ages. They say that if, we, if they defeat Russia, then we defeat Russia. That's kind of, it's played out, right? So Ukraine is fighting, they say, valiantly against Putin, and therefore it's like all of us fighting against Putin, right? And uh, most people that put their flags up, you know, the Ukraine flags on their, on their uh, profile, on their Facebook profile or Instagram profile or outside their homes. I have no idea. They couldn't tell you where Ukraine is. Most people wouldn't be able to tell you where Ukraine is. In fact, uh, most people wouldn't be able to tell you where the U.S. is anyway. So uh, if you've seen those videos, they're, they're hilarious. Uh, they're hilarious because it just makes me think like, wow, how far have we gotten in society? Uh, of young kids, like in their 20s, being asked questions like, you know, like what... Uh, Tell me a country that starts with a U. And they go, oh, well, I don't know. Utah. Yeah, something like that, right? And um, they're, they're, they're real funny videos. It's tragic, but they're funny because kids, they're young kids. They don't even know where, you know, what's the, what, what borders the U.S. to the south? What borders the U.S. to the north? You know, where's the Great Wall of China? They go, uh, Mexico? You know, that, it's just unreal. It, yes, and we do find people like that. I and mean, it's, not, it's not to say that there isn't people like that, but it's, it's becoming more and more the norm. So people don't know where Ukraine is. They just simply, the media just tells them. Vote for this, do this, do that, and they go for it, right? And um, but one thing that's really interesting is uh, we are at a very, very difficult spot. And I, I want to take the time to talk about it here because I think, as a, as a church, as believers, as people, we do need to be aware and be praying for that. This is much more, much more sinister and much more dangerous than anything in the last two years. You know, people went into lockdowns. People began to get medicine. People began to fight with each other. And it wasn't even real. It was just a facade, meaning that people just began to believe crazy things. This is no crazy thing. This is, this is about as real as you can get. And there's never been a, the U.S. hasn't been in any, uh, this close to a war since the Vietnam, Korea War. But in terms of World War, since World War II. Now, in 1983, there was, I don't know if you guys remember 1983, um, but if you go back in history, 1983, there was, uh, remember the Korean airline that was shut down by the Russians? Okay. And um, Ronald Reagan was president, and he challenged the, the, the Russia, and it says this was evil, and this was this, it was that, and it was very close to a major war. It was a major war. Now, you might not have thought it at that time, but it was looking back at history and reading what was being gone in at that time, it was very close. Now, there hasn't been anything close to that until now. And most kids and most young people and most middle-aged people have never even thought of a war. Now, how do we look at it like this? So Janet Yellen, right? Janet Yellen, she's our treasure secretary. 
she makes a surprising visit to Ukraine to tell him how amazing he is, even though there's a lot of things about Zelensky I can tell you, and she gives him $1.2 billion, with the B, dollars, more, more money, after Biden being there, I think last week, and gave them a half a billion dollars. So it's also the idea that we have, I think it's $100 billion that we've given them. It, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is unbelievable how much money has gone into Ukraine for the war. Now, they're also working on taking $300 billion from Russia by freezing some of their assets, right, and transfer them to Ukraine, Ukraine to rebuild it even more. Now, when they say rebuild, forget it. No one's going to see a single penny of that. It's all going to go into, uh, you know, the top echelon of the Ukraine. China's involved now. And this is where it gets more interesting because China says we have a peace plan. And that peace plan is to bring Russia and to bring Ukraine to the table and settle the issue. And they put out a 12-point agenda that if the Russia and Ukraine does this, we're going to be able to have peace. The U.S. is livid over this. Now, China went to Belarus. They're trying to create a peace plan, but China has other plans. China has other plans in which is to uh, sort of unite with the Eastern European bloc along with Russia and bring at odds with the U.S. So this is the other card that's about to drop is the fact that the U.S. could be facing a two-front war, China and Russia. Now, if you ever wanted, if you ever thought that Russia and China will ever be together, Nobody would ever thought about it. They were mortal enemies for a long time. Well, it took the U.S. government, this particular government, to get them together and to actually make them a pact so they could actually fight against the U.S. Now, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, he's open to the proposal, actually. He wants to discuss this because, by the way, he's the, they're the only ones who are talking peace. The U.S. used to be the only one that talked about peace. Now we're the only ones that talk about war. And the U.S. is seeking more money into Ukraine to create this war. And so if I'm telling you that nations of the world are trying to create a war, make no mistake about it, they are. They are trying to create a war, and it's not going to be a small scrimmage. It's, it involves the powers of the world. This is what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about major wars, major confrontations of kingdom against kingdom, not small nations only, but kingdoms against kingdoms. And, and China, of course, is one of the superpowers of today, along with Russia, along with the U.S., uh, along with other seven nations, we we'll call them the G7, and try to create and coordinate um, an attack on the world. Now, officially, officially, the U.S. has said, China's given already weapons to Russia or at least planning on giving weapons to Russia. So they will provide more details, they say. So you see how this is being ramped up. It's money, Ukraine. It's China's bad. It's Russia's bad. We need to stop this. And even Zelensky, which is kind of an odd thing. I don't have the video. I was going to play it, but it was going to take too long. Um, this is what he said. He says that they, the U.S., if the U.S. doesn't act against Russia, this is Zelensky, then eventually the U.S. will have to send their sons and their daughters to Europe to find a ground battle, and they will fight there, and they will die there, they said, because just like the Ukrainian soldiers have been dying. So this guy, who has been asking for more money, more planes, more weapons, more of everything, the U.S. has sent them basically everything but the kitchen sink, um, is wanting more. And it's even, even talking about sending U.S., U.S. Uh, sons and daughters militarily, uh, NA, uh, U.S. troops along with NATO troops on the battlefields to protect the Baltic Sea. Um, they don't want peace. Make sure you know that. They don't want peace. And this is a horrific, a horrific event that's happening. And I think uh, as Christians, we need to really understand that. Because one thing is for sure, we need to prepare mentally as if this war could happen. And it's not going to be a little scrimmage. You know, how, you know the, the, the Iraqi war, the Afghanistan war, where we just watch it on TV and, just, and they show the targets and we're like, oh, it's so far away. We're not going to think about anything. This is quite different. And I believe this is one of those wars that 
people have been ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, and God forbid there is a war, but it seems to be very close to uh, a real war. And today, Russia was attacked. Russia was attacked through drones. Now, just, uh, I have the, yeah, there's a map. Um, it's near Crimea. This is the area of Crimea, just southeast of Crimea. And drones, possibly from Ukraine, possibly from the U.S., we don't know. Um, so I can't overemphasize this. This is, this is like tittering on war, right? Um, these drones came in. So it would have been Tuesday evening. Sorry, Tuesday evening for us. And reportedly attacked a major oil refineries in Russia. Uh, this is an area of Topsy. Topsy just, um, it's in Russian there, but you can't see it. This is south and east of Crimea. And uh, there was a fire. There was a fire. And overnight, there was all these drones being spotted, even over St. Peter, Petersburg. So who's sending these drones? Why are they attacking Russia? You see the point. They want to create this war. They want to start this war at all costs. And... Um, Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine, uh, is trying to, you know, trying to distance themselves from that. But um, we can say that these a lot of these uh, a lot of these drones are probably from Kiev, probably from Ukraine, and uh, we'll see more in a moment if there's any any ones that are being captured or shot down. But Russia is very upset about this, as, as you can tell, and so there's more of this to come. And I don't think we could ignore it anymore. I think people usually try to ignore it. They're, Look, I got problems at home. I got problems at work. I got problems everywhere. Okay, we, yeah, we do. All of us do. Um, it's the last thing you need. But the last thing you need to, it's the last thing you need to ignore. It's a possible war that it's going to be major powers being involved. And it's already, I mean, so much money has gone out of the U.S. So much uh, military uh, has gone to Ukraine from the U.S. Uh, basically footing the, the bill on this. Not NATO, it's the U.S. So when things become really expensive and when things become really, really difficult economically, we could all say, well, I had no idea what was going on. No, they've been sending a lot of money, printing a lot of money and sending it to Ukraine. Now, one thing that it's interesting, and this is in South Africa. South Africa is having so many blackouts, rolling blackouts. And the only reason I bring this up is this. We know believers there, one. Secondly, I think it's an interesting model for countries that decided that, hmm, we should go green. We should try to bring up all these other type of energies, alternative energies, rather than investing in the known energy, which is fossil fuel energy, and, um, and see how it goes. And so the government there is warning that there is a huge breakdown in the electrical grid and it's soon going to collapse. And it's soon going to collapse in such a way that there'll be riots. So if you want to see, I don't want to say a crystal ball, but if you want to see down the hall of the future, if America begins to have problems with the grid, if America begins to have problems in blackouts, here's one example. South Africa, civil war conditions because of the possibility of the energy grid collapsing meaning that they, they never spent a lot of money in infrastructure. They kind of let it go out, kind of like us. And um, these power cuts, these power outages, they last about 12 hours. That's the hardest thing about that. They last 12 hours, and it's so much money to bring it back up after rolling blackouts. They, they, that's, the, that's the worst part about it. It takes so long and so much money to get it up and running again, only to have it done the next day. And it just rolls and rolls and, and people are getting really desperate. Now, the U.S. government has warned U.S. citizens there that they need to prepare. Now, notice this, to prepare for total collapse of the power grid, right? I know it doesn't affect you today. You can have other problems but this is something that we ought to know. Why? Because we've never had any electrical grid problems, right? <laughs> it's not under attack, right? It's not, you know that there's been, I think it's like the attacks on a power grid. That means hackers or in, in terms of um, normal attacks on the grids. That means people try to affect it and physically damage it. It's been up 70% the last year in the United States. So our electrical grid is a problem. It's been a problem for a while. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people just say, well, it only takes one accident 
like what happened in Texas a couple of years ago, and you'll have a big problem. There's no energy and there's no electricity. Now, the embassy advised, advised the U.S. citizens, listen to this. And this is, I guess, a, um, an interesting case. 72 hours, right? You need to maintain 72 hours of supply. That means food, three liters of water per day per person, medicine, and first aid because they don't know how long these things are going to last. Now, is it going to be a total collapse soon, tomorrow, the next day? Probably not. But give it enough time and give it enough uh, rolling blackouts, these things are not going to end well in South Africa. So uh, we, you guys have talked to some believers in South Africa. We know some believers in South Africa. Some of them have left. It's, a, it's already been a problem. If you're white in South Africa, you're not welcomed. It's already been a major civil war in South Africa, but things continue to get more difficult. Now, I want to switch over to Israel. The other point, the other big part of the, of the coin is another meeting at the UN. Third one this past week. Emergency meeting. Why? Because on the West Bank, you know, when I say West Bank, I mean the heart of Israel. I mean uh, Samaria, the mountains of Judah, right? These are the, the, the heart of the land of Israel. Uh, Shechem, where, where Abraham went, when J- Isaac and Jacob went, right? Uh, this is at the Jericho. This is the heart of Israel. There's been some tremendous scrimmages there. In fact, um, the, Israel actually had a operation, Operation Shechem, to liberate some of the cities from the terrorists that have been so at it. Now, when I was in Israel in November, we were supposed to go to Shechem. We are supposed to go to this area. We could not go. It was too dangerous. Even in November, it was too dangerous. There were riots. Um, people were getting stabbed left and right. It's always been a hotbed. So no matter where, when you go, it's always been a hotbed because of the Palestinians and Muslims always attacking Jewish people. And because they have different license plates and all that stuff, you can kind of tell who's a Jew, who's not. Uh, it becomes very dangerous for Jews. They have to drive. You know, some people live there. They have to drive through that area. And... Um, Israel said, forget it. We're going in, and we're going to take the terrorists out. Well, after the attack, right, so Ashkelon and Esterot, right, communities that are closer to Gaza began to experience rockets coming in from Hamas, right? So Israel fired back, and it says, we're not going to take this, and they began to intercept the rockets and begin to attack Gaza. So the operation went well. They got rid of the terrorists, but now Hamas is sending rockets into Israel. So as soon as Israel begins to respond, now you got a meeting. The UN is ready to, again, um, condemn Israel, and so much so. But the, the interesting thing is, well, they always condemn Israel. That's true. But here's the interesting thing is, Israel has conducted so many attacks already into Syria, into Iran, because they know Iran is very, very much close to using uh, drone and te- drone, drone technology to hit back at Israel, hit back at different, uh, uh, different areas of Israel. And so Israel is ready to, without the U.S. approval or not, ready to attack Iran. Now, this might be unusual because we can always see that Israel's always been Asking for permission from, from the United States. It's always been that way. But because the U.S. has been incompetent, Israel's been moving further and further away. Now, I have no idea why, but I can tell you why, but it doesn't make sense to me. Israel's closer to Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, leaning on them for airspace and for support more than the U.S. This is crazy. Crazy times. Uh, why? Because... Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries also are afraid of Iran in a big way. Iran has the capabilities of nuclear, nuclear weapons. And uh, we're already dealing with one issue here, which is what's, gonna, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. Now, another issue is this one. You see how the world is it's just incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to maneuver. Now, this story was even more bizarre. Iran not only sending weapons to Syria to attack Israel, but now Brazil is allowing uh, Iranian Navy ships to come into their port in Rio 
and just docked there. Just the Iranian Navy ships and just docked there. Now, Brazil to the U.S. is not that far. I mean, it's, it's far, but it's not as far as Iran to the U.S. And two Iranian warships are docked right there. Now, what, now if you say, well, who cares, right? You realize two Iranian warships are on the coast in the, in the Caribbean, well, not the Caribbean, the Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean, very close to the U.S., if you think about it, very close to the U.S., at the behest of the president of Brazil, who is a World Economic Forum member, Lula da Silva, who is a criminal, who's a criminal by all means, and there's no denying that they're there with the approval of the president without any concern for the U.S. Now, it used to be that Brazil wouldn't do anything unless the U.S. approved it. Now, they don't care. You see the point? Israel doesn't care. Brazil doesn't care. Iran doesn't care. You think Russia cares? You think China cares? No. Why? Um, the U.S. is at an all-time low in terms of uh, respect or peace or any sort of thing. So it, it, is the, it is a time of war because there's really no one that is policing anybody else. It used to be the U.S. was the police of the world. Now, a couple of other things. We have to pay attention to this one. The World Health Organization, or the WHO, is wanting to bring this pandemic accord very quickly. Now, all it takes is treasonous government, like the current one that we're in, to agree with the World Health Organization that the U.S. will subjugate themselves under the WHO. That means that 127 nations can vote the same way, but the U.S. has already said that they will vote this way that they will put themselves under the who for any decision-making of any sort of um, emergency, emergency of a pandemic or a serious illness that's going on in the world. They, are, they will put themselves under the who. That means the who will basically dictate who gets vaccinated, who doesn't, which uh, states get locked down, which states don't get locked down. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it, uh, who's he's more of a constitutional lawyer. He has at least, I said, well, how can this hold? Can, can this hold true? And he says, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't normally. <laughs> but we're not living in normal times. All it would take is the Congress to say, forget it. It's not going to happen. All it would take is the Senate to say, you can't make... Joe Biden, you can't make laws, you can't make, um, um, you can't make arrangements with other, uh, and make pacts with other organizations without first being ratified by the Senate and the Congress. You can't do that. But my friend said, do you think any of these guys are going to say no? You think the Senate is going to say no? I think the Senate is going to definitely say yes. You think the Congress? Maybe, but do they have enough teeth? I mean, they can't even stop the SEC from uh, coming down on companies that the SEC doesn't like, right? Um, the, the Congress doesn't make any laws anymore. Have you noticed that in your country, in our country? Um, if you went to history class, right, during your time in high school, they told you that there was three branches, right? The executive, judicial, right? And which is the other one? The legislator. What, which, who, who makes the laws? Congress, right? Is it, when was the last time you heard Congress make any laws? It's usually now executive order, the president signs it, Congress is under, under hands, says nothing, or it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court makes a decision because they feel like they're God. They can make a decision on anything. It, it was never supposed to be like that in our country. It's supposed to be Congress, but Congress doesn't make any laws anymore. Do you think this World Health Organization law, pandemic uh, accord, is going to have any opposition anymore? Well, I hope it does. Now, they're hoping that 127 nations will sign it by May. So it's in May. So all it takes is, imagine this, all it takes is one more health uh, panic, and all of a sudden you would have had the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, coming down and saying, this state closes down, this state doesn't clock, you know, this, whatever. You know, they will make the decisions instead of the Constitution. Now, it's going to be frightening to think about it because um, I'm not going to tell you this one's it, but have you noticed how much the uh, H15, whatever it's going to be called now, uh, bird flu is gaining momentum uh, in the UK and, 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 and other parts of Europe? 
one lady, I think she was a Cambodian lady, she, they say she died from it. So a lot of people are getting alarmed that this, you know, it's killed so many chickens. That's why the price of chicken is so high. And, uh, you know, they, they've also killed a lot of chickens. They also had a lot of accidents and, 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 uh, and, uh, and food plants. Um, but there is something that we need to keep an eye on. As soon as an outbreak happens, and if this thing goes through, Forget any rights that any, any Americans have. And it's going to become very difficult to, once it's ratified, once it becomes law, quote unquote, law of the land, it's going to be very difficult to overcome it. So a lot of people fear that this could be the beginnings of something that there'll be a rebellion in the U.S. Because a lot, do you think a lot of states are going to go with this? I said, well, maybe this one will. Maybe other ones will, but not all of them. And what's going to happen if those states don't go along with that, right? You see the problem? There's going to be a lot of friction. I mean, we're already heading toward a national divorce. I don't know if you noticed that. We're already headed toward a national divorce because the, the, the liberals and conservative states don't care for each other. They don't get along. They, there's really nothing in common, really nothing in common. And so uh, most historians feel like it's just going to be a national divorce, uh, meaning that they're going to just stop dealing with each other. The southern states, the conservative states, won't have anything to do with the liberal states. And the liberal states don't care about the conservative states. So it doesn't really, does it really matter? Now, I hope it doesn't go into a civil war. Um, but here, World Economic Forum. What they like to do because of all this, and one thing that has changed in our world is this. What they would like to do is they would like to track everything that's going on, just like the World Health Organization, just like the war, just like economic trouble. Uh, they would like to track everything. So I'm going to play this video. Is that okay, Chris? Okay, this is, this is uh, three weeks ago at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos. And I think I played it here before, but it's, it was good to recycle it back and just listen to it again because it's, it's making sense more and more what they say because ultimately, this is ultimately what they would like to do. We're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Mm. Stay tuned. We don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. This is the president of Alibaba, the Canadian branch. Alibaba is a big Chinese Amazon. I'm going to understand it that way. And he bragged that the World Economic Forum could track any system. Basically, they would like to monitor you, the way you shop, where you travel, what you eat, where you go, where you go and eat, right? And, uh, and the tech giants are very much at the behest of the World Economic Forum, and they may be doing that already. I don't know if you noticed, but your phone, you know, tracks you, hears you, all that stuff, right? And so uh, it's going to be more indicative now because it's going to be a time for data collecting, and people are going to be tracked. Make no mistake about it. People are going to be tracked even more especially if they go into digital ID, which a lot of countries are willing to do, and central bank digital currency. Your currency will be different. You won't have Visa, MasterCard, or cash, right? Now, um, you know, people say, well, they're never going to get rid of cash. Have you ever thought about that? They're so close to getting rid of cash now? And it all happened within the last two years. It sped up to such degree, three years actually now. Um, this was actually kind of interesting. Uh, you all heard of AI, right? Artificial intelligence. It's growing in popularity. It's going to become part of our society. It's already changing the way people do things. You know, uh, reporters are going to be replaced. Journalists are going to be replaced. Uh, actors are going to be replaced. Coders are going to be replaced because it could do everything. It could do anything for you, right? Now, scientists want to create artificial intelligence using human brain cells. And they already started doing this. In John, Hop John Hopkins University, they constructed human brain, right? They constructed construct an AI using human brain cells, meaning that they literally just basically put uh, 800,000 living brain cells and, uh, and linked it to an AI. And it worked. The AI was able to successfully learn, believe it or not, it learned how to play Pong. Now, you guys remember that game, right? Pong? No? Okay. I think it was like the first video game ever. My wife was very good at it, right? And uh, go, no, you weren't good at it. I heard you were. Yeah, yeah. Tick, tick, 
you know, just a little ball bouncing back and forth, right? The AI with human brain cells learned how to play Pong very quickly. Now you think that's what's a big deal. I was good at it, right? No, but uh, this is an AI with human brain cells and activity. You think, well, how does this work? I don't know, but they made it work. And they're hoping that by integrating organic material, it was called an, it's called an organoid. That's what they call them now. They had to make a whole word, an organoid, that it will, it will, you know what they're trying to do is get rid of silicon. So silicon computer chips, you know, they have to be made out of silicon in order to, for it to transfer the, you know, um, for the chip to function and the heat and all that. Now they're going to be use human brain cells instead of silicon. So there's no need for Silicon Valley anymore. They'll just use computer. Where are they going to get the brain cells? I always wonder that, right? Uh, don't don't even <laughs> don't even ask because then it'll be like really conspiracy theory, right? Now the goal of the goal of transhumanism because this is what transhumanism is. Transhumanism is a science. It's a respected science now of integrating machine with humanity. And they call that, when they reach that level, when machine and humans merge together, they call it singularity. It's a big deal. It's never happened. It's never happened. It has not reached. Most people think it will never happen. When basically you have the merge of human beings with machines, you have, you know, cyborgs, whatever the, 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 the term is in terms of the sci-fi world. Um, all this, I believe, it's, it's, it's ending. And what the Bible, Bible actually predicted this, I believe, I believe the Bible predicted something similar to this. I don't know what the end result would be, but he called it, the, the Bible called it, John called it the image of the beast. Uh, it will be an image and will be able to speak and it will be able to put people to death. It will be an incredible thing. And how does this work? Uh, scholars throughout history have wondered, how does the image of the beast work? How, will they, how would it work? How can the, 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 the false prophet would give power to the, to the image of the beast and it will be able to do things unimaginable? Could be we be seeing something like that? I don't know. But it's sort of starting to sound like it, right? Um, I remember I had a friend of mine. He passed away a long time ago. He was a uh, you know, pretty good Bible teacher, loved prophecy stuff. Uh, but one thing he says, you know, I don't know how this will work, he says, but it's definitely not the technology. And I said, I really think technology is going to play a big part in the future and how these things develop and what, the, what John ultimately saw, I don't know. But I believe technology will play a major role in how prophecy ends up happening. And I'll give you this. The computing power. Think of computing power, meaning how fast it can process information. Now, we don't really understand this that well because uh, we just maybe haven't been around that long. Uh, but the computing power by 20, it's about 2023, 20, 2024, 20, it will reach that level. Uh, the computing power in a computer, super correct computer, or uh, all those uh, new computers, super fast computers that are coming, um, it will overtake human capacity. I mean, it will be faster. It will be able to understand things more than a human capacity can. And by 2025, 20, 45, it will surpass uh, all human intelligence collectively. That's only, what, less than 20 Two years, about 22 years, it'll pass all of collective humanity's intelligence. The computing power of your phone, obviously, it's much better than any computer they had in the 80s and 90s. And the, you see how it just goes up and up like that? It's, it's, it's incremental. It's exponential, what they call it, meaning that uh, it is happening at a faster rate, meaning that at some point, it only took basically from the Internet to have the human genome the catalog, it took about 10 years. So the beginning of the internet to the human genome, it took about 10 years. Before that, it would took like 30 years just to get, you know, to get from the first computers to the internet. It was like 30, 40 years. And the, the speed, it becomes incremental, incremental, meaning that it just goes up, 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 to the point where you can't, and this is the crazy thing, you won't be able to even understand or comprehend how fast things are moving in terms of computing power in the world. It is really hard to understand how fast it would be, meaning that things that we do now and things that computing power now, it'll be completely obsolete by next year at, at the speed, at the speed of it. Uh, so much so that military, it's actually military technology is growing with this, meaning that what they're doing in Ukraine and Russia war, it is almost like Star Wars, meaning that the computing power of drones, the computing power of AI, it's a lot of it is artificial intelligence, sending the troops, radar, data, 
all that is being calculated by artificial intelligence. Uh, you think of chatbot GPT, which is a very famous thing that people use now, uh, which is basically taking away a lot of jobs. You can use it. It's free. You can use, Anybody can use People write articles. People can take uh, tweets and write, like, if you put it three tweets, it can tell you, uh, like, can write your whole story about yourself. If you put three tweets about yourself, it'll write a whole story about you. If you want to lose weight, just it'll it'll give you a fifteen work a fifteen week uh, workout program with diet everything tell you how to do it. Uh, if you don't know how to code, you don't need to learn how to code. It codes for you, right? Uh, if you want to you know, trade in the stock market, it can create a code for you, and you can make people make money because it just creates a code and it tells you when to buy, when to sell. It is crazy what they what they're able to do, and within two months, it crossed one hundred million users. Within two months, it just came out like in November. Within two months, it crossed 100 million users, and this is about Chatbot GPT, which is you know, for free. I'm not encouraging you to do it. I'm just saying people can go use it. People are using it now. It's actually two or three generations behind the fastest AI that the government has today. So things that are like top of the line artificial intelligence, uh, it's two three generations ahead of what people could see. And people can play with today on the internet. By the way, it's not even connected to the internet. Chatbot GPT is not connected to the internet, meaning that you do have to go to the internet and try it, but the artificial intelligence itself, it's not connected to the internet, meaning that the only information it has is what's been put in and being able to uh, recognize code and create all this stuff. It's crazy. Wait until they connect it to the internet. It's going to have access to millions and millions of data, uh, amounts of data, be able to... I don't know what it'll be able to do. I mean, right now you can you can ask it to create an image of a cat. Just type it in, Im- create an image, and it'll give you like a, a beautiful image of a cat that you won't find anywhere on the internet because it's not connected to the internet. You can ask it to do all kinds of things. This is getting scary in terms of how, what things they could do. It is quite quite amazing, you know. Um, I think I got one more. Yeah, yeah, I got one more. Uh, this is, again, very sad. I, I, I talked about it on Catching Up with Jacob last Friday, and I did play a video. Can I, I, I do have the video, though, Chris. I for sure I have it. Can I play? All right. Now, this is in Kensington, Philadelphia, the capital of fentanyl, all right? And if you think it's only in Philadelphia, i got to tell you some statistics, but it is very sad to see this, some of the things that these uh, people on Kensington Street in Philadelphia are going through. So I'll play this real quick.
it is very sad to see people just dragging themselves on the street uh, on fentanyl. You think it was only fentanyl. By the way, fentanyl, it is a leading cause of death between uh, adults 18 to 45. So the leading cause of death is not the virus. It's not anything. It is fentanyl and is being brought in through the border because we have a, an open border now. And uh, it doesn't matter. You just bring it in from China through Mexican border. And uh, more than a million Americans have died of drug overdose since the year 2000. More than a million just on drug overdose, and it's the highest rate is between ages and 18 to 45. Now, if it wasn't bad enough, uh, California and Arizona have, um, you know, been able to seize enough fentanyl that would have uh, basically uh, killed about 80,000 people. That's how much fentanyl is coming in. It would have been able to kill 80,000 people. They stopped it at the border in, in, in California and in Arizona. But now... It's being mixed in with a horse tranquilizer called xylazine. Xylazine, it is 50 times more potent than fentanyl. And it's being mixed with fentanyl. And so people go into this. If you really want to see a zombie, you know, zombie apocalypse, this is exactly, I wish I could play the video for you, uh, which you would see people dragging themselves through the streets. Completely their mind is blown out. Uh, it's so powerful. I wish I could show you some of the pictures that it, um, it actually eats away at the skin of the person. So we got these people that have come in and their legs are being like rotten from the inside and it becomes so horrific, the state of these people that they really have no way out except a miracle, except, except the Lord coming in. And, and, and I was talking to Jay and David Lister about it last time and I said, man, this is, this is getting to the point where the only hope for these people is really... It's always been the gospel, but there's no medicine that can help them. There's nobody that can do anything for them except the Lord. It's called a zombie drug because people are go absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy over this. And uh, meth and fentanyl seizures have continued to increase for the last few weeks in California and Arizona. And now it's being mixed in with horse tranquilizer. It's a society that's going to be absolutely destroyed. It's interesting. The Bible does speak about pharmakia. The Bible does speak about drug abuse and sorcery, which is related to it, uh, in the last days, people are not going to be able to repent from this. They're not going to be willing to repent from it because they're going to be so attached to drug abuse. And, and of course, this comes with occult practices. It's quite amazing to see this. And, um, oh, by the way, it's not in Philadelphia only. They have found it now in L.A., uh, that type of drug, fentanyl mixed with xylazine. It is all over L.A. They're seeing it more and more cases in LA. So we're going to see it in other states as well. It is, it is permeating. It is permeating. And have you heard the government do, want to do anything about it? Absolutely none. They don't care. They, I think the only president that I ever heard, and this is not to sound, you know, the trumpet for any president, you know, Trump was the only guy who said, you know what, we need to deal with this. Now, did he do anything about it? Eh, maybe not as much as he should have, uh, but he at least was the only president. This is not a endorsement for him. But I didn't hear Biden say anything. Obama definitely did not say anything. Bush definitely didn't do anything about it. Uh, it's almost like it's purposeful. I know, conspiratorial stuff, whatever, right? But they don't want to end this because it's literally, people that are addicted to this are so much easier to control. People that are addicted to marijuana, people that are addicted to any drugs, a lot easier to control. So you had up, uh, you had organizations like George Soros. Guess what they endorse? Marijuana. Uh, marijuana in California, marijuana in Arizona, and Colorado. They were the, the biggest donors to try to make marijuana legal. Why? Person on drugs, person on, that's an addict is a lot easier to control. You know, person that uh, they're not going to fight you. They're just going to be completely gone. So uh, one final thing, and this is, this is pretty cool. Leave you on a, on a good note. We talked about the Bible earlier and how important it is. One of the areas of the Bible that's really, really fascinating to me, it's always been archaeology and history, how archaeology and history proves the Bible. This is sort of an apologetics thing, meaning, you know, defending the faith. But this week, an inscription of King Darius was found in Israel was found in the area of Lachish, just north of, uh, north of Jerusalem. Uh, the inscription is 2,500 years old. It's amazing. It's an inscription bearing the name of Darius, King Darius. 
Now, it was such an amazing thing. They never found anything close to this, how clear it was. And I don't know ancient Persian, but I have to trust the archaeologists because uh, there were not Christian archaeologists who found it. They were Jewish archaeologists who found it. And it says, it says, this is King Darius the Great. And it literally says, the year of Darius, the year 24 of Darius, meaning that Darius... Uh, uh, was in his 24 year of reign, and he actually reigned from 498 to 522. I'm sorry, 522 to 486. So quite a long time, actually. And Darius, it's actually in Scripture. This is what what is amazing about the Bible. His son is named Ahasuerus. His son was Ahasuerus, and his son is actually named in the Bible too. In the Book of Esther, we're going to read about Ahasuerus next week. Ahasuerus was a, a great king. Now, most people thought he was a drunk and all that stuff, but he ruled quite capable for in a large regions from India all the way to Central Asia, uh, all the way to the, to the west, to the Balkans. I mean, it was quite an amazing, amazing reign. But Darius is found in the Bible. I don't know if you ever read the book of Daniel, but Darius is found in the Bible. He's the, the king that foolishly signed that law that would have condemned anybody praying to anybody else but the king, and Daniel actually prayed to God toward Jerusalem, and he was, uh, he was in prison, thrown into the lion's den. And Darius was very concerned for Daniel because he had a lot of respect for Daniel. So it's quite interesting. This is, uh, uh, again, a marvelous, marvelous uh, find. And this is, again, right around the Purim story. And it tells you one thing. Darius was a real person in the book of Daniel, as well as Ahasuerus was a real person in the book of Daniel and um, so the scholars are very interested about finding more things because it proves the book of Esther, the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, and the book of Daniel are absolutely 100% true. Isn't that amazing? Our Bible is absolutely true. This is a great, archaeology proves it along the way. So many, and there's so many, once you're in Israel, you realize there's so many uh, things they haven't come out with yet that are there, so many findings uh, we just don't hear about them because they're sometimes suppressed. Sometimes Islam, the Muslims don't want it to come out because it proves the archaeology of Israel is true. And so they were the first people there. So there's a lot of political things, but so much stuff like Goliath's rocks. And you know, when you go to the Valley of Elad and you see the rocks are there and it's, it's quite amazing. Long story, uh, which means this too. And this is at the end what it actually means. It is, if the archaeology of the Bible is true and the history of the Bible is true, and this event in history is 100% true. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus didn't happen in philosophy. It didn't happen out of space. It didn't happen in, in just a, you know, in, in a book of uh, good moral values. It happened in a book that describes the history of mankind, the history of Israel. And so God intervened in human history in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, who died for our sins, who died and paid the penalty for humanity's sins, going back to Adam and my sins and your sins, and was raised from the dead to justify us and to be raised as the Son of God, meaning that Jesus was proven right, vindicated that he's the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead through the Holy Spirit. So it's quite an amazing thing. We can talk more about it and, and, and have, have more of a discussion. But the gospel is true, my friend. Gospel is very real. It happened in history. And because it happened in history, and because God is a God of history, and He's the only one who can go past, present, and future, it means that no one will be able to undo the cross and the resurrection. There's nobody that will be able to undo what happened. And therefore, our trust in Jesus is secure by the very fact that God Himself uh, is the only one who could have done this. God himself is the only one who could put himself in the history of man and pay the penalty of sin for us. And no one can undo it. That's the amazing thing when you think about history. No one's going to be able to change history. It is locked in forever. That means that the cross and the resurrection will never be undone. As we trust in Jesus Christ, our salvation is secure in him because he's the only one that can, and nobody will be able to undo what happened. And so uh, when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, when the Bible speaks about that our sins are passed away, they really did happen. That really did happen because the Messiah really came down in history and no one will be able to undo what happened there. Archaeology proves it. History proves it. And guess what? 
Prophecy proves it too. Because as these things we talk about today come to pass, as much as painful as they are, and as much as difficulty as it may bring into our lives, it also confirms that the God of the Bible is the only one who knows the past, who's here in the present, and knows the future. He knows the end from the beginning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your blessings and your goodness and your mercy are with us every morning. Great freshness that we have because of your faithfulness. We have them. We, we can claim these promises for us and for our family. As, as Peter said to the, to the Jews in Acts, this is for you, for your family, and for those who are far off. And so, Lord, we were once far off. We were once out of the reach uh, of the commonwealth of Israel. We were out of the promises of God, but we have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever barrier there was, it's been done away. And through the blood of his cross, we have forgiveness of sin. We have peace with God. Thank you for the grace you've given us. Thank you, Lord God, that you are the end from the beginning. You are the alpha and the omega, and no one will ever be able to undo what you have done. And therefore, history is secure, and our future is also secure because you have promised that you who began a good work is faithful to complete it until the end. So the new Jerusalem is for sure going to be populated with believers. Lord God, I pray that we will continue to be faithful, that we will be counted faithful to escape the things that are coming upon the earth, Lord God, but we'll be counted faithful to enter into the new Jerusalem because it says those who come into the new Jerusalem Those are the ones who keep the commandments of God. So, Lord, help us to keep loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And help us, Lord God, to love one another as you have loved us. And we praise you and thank you for what you've done in Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.